So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good night. Uh, so thank you all that you are joining us today for another very interesting talk in a very hot topic that will be given by Professor Rafael Brun. And uh, now I give the floor to Professor Paulo Buntzin from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul uh, to be the session chair and to introduce uh, Professor Rafael Brun. So thank you. The floor is with you, Paul. Thank you, Professor Ricardo, to invited me to be the chair of this talk. It's it's a pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, Professor Rafael, he holds a master and a PhD in microelectronics from University of Montpellier, and a computer engineering degree from University. Uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. He is currently an associate professor in the electrical engineering department of URGS. He is member of IEEE and in the Brazilian Society of Microelectronics. He is currently researching the compact modeling and co-simulation of magnetic tunnel junctions devices that are the basic building block of MRAM memories, the topic of this talk. Then it's a pleasure to have you here, Rafael. The world is with you. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, actually, I feel quite at home. Not only because I am at home, but because uh, I started uh, with Ricardo, uh, the CAS talks two years ago, uh, evolving from uh, the seminars that uh, we used to do in the microelectronics department and uh, actually the, the microelectronics uh, graduate program that were uh, responsibility of Ricardo. And, and then uh, because of the pandemic, we, we went on and uh, made them online. So uh, I'm very thrilled to see uh, how much they evolved. And I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, in this afternoon here in Brazil and uh, in every other time elsewhere. So um, today my talk uh, will be about emerging memory technologies. So uh, my objective here is to give you a introduction on the subject and to uh, talk about the most uh, promising technologies and talk about the consolidated technologies that uh, would have their place took by the new emerging memory technologies and some of the, the most uh, exciting applications. So in the final part of the talk, I will uh, introduce a little bit what we are doing to uh, pursue this objective here at UFRGS and uh, further uh, the research and, and uh, maybe uh, pave the path to uh, have those emerging memories as uh, real contenders for uh, taking over the market. So um, let me jump to my presentation here. So you are already seeing the presentation, I suppose. I don't know. Now I, I think you are seeing the next slide, right, Paulo? OK. <clears throat> so I am also part of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul which was founded in 1934. It has uh, close to uh, 50,000 students and about uh, 800 uh, research teams. We offer more than 87 undergraduate programs. We have uh, 81 graduate schools in different subjects, ranging from healthcare to uh, technology and education. We are about uh, 2,500 professors and 2,500 uh, technical staff that helps us uh, moving forward. So uh, on the right side, you see the Brazilian map and we are down south in the state of Rio Grande do Sul and on the east side of the state by, by the lake, you can see Porto Alegre. Maybe you can see my mouse. Let me see if I can highlight it. Yeah, so there you go. Here's Porto Alegre. Um, I'm also part of the School of Engineering at UFRGS, so um, you can see we, we, we are mostly situated in a central campus, uh, in, in buildings that uh, were built uh, 
a hundred years ago, more or less. So we are now last year we made uh, our hundred and twenty fifth anniversary. So we were founded in eight hundred ninety six, and we have now uh, more than five thousand and five hundred students. So we are roughly ten percent of uh, the university, and we graduated over twenty thousand students since our foundation, and from. We are roughly 10% of the professors of the university as well. So the yellow building you see near, uh, so in, in the middle of the town, in the, the central picture is actually where I work. But not now because of the pandemic, but soon we'll be going back uh, to those buildings and uh, seeing the students face to face again. And I'm also part of the graduate program in microelectronics. Uh, in the UFRGS, which is a joint venture with the School of Geng Engineering, Institute of Physics, the Institute of Informatics, and the Institute of Chemistry. And we are um, the only program in Brazil that uh, has microelectronics in its title, and we are one of the pioneering uh, graduate schools in this field. So here you can see uh, some of the uh, labs and, and chips that were made uh, in, the past, uh, in the past decade or the past two decades, more or less. Um, so you are welcome to um, take a look at our website. So it's www.ufrgs.br slash pgmicro and take a look at the program and the lines of research uh, we are actually, uh, we are actually uh, involved in nowadays. We, you can see several uh, cast talks uh, that were given by professors of this uh, graduate program as well. So don't uh, miss, don't miss it. Check it out. So uh, in this talk, I will give a brief introduction uh, about memories. Uh, so we are we assume that uh, you were familiar uh, with concepts of uh, IC design. If you are not, you can take a look at other cost talks that were given on this subject as well. Um, then we'll talk about established memory technologies or consolidated memory technology. So the ones that you find uh, in every electronic device nowadays, such as SRAN, DRAN, and Flash. Then we talk about uh, emerging memory technologies. So I will focus mostly on MRAN because it's uh, my uh, subject for, for the past decade. But uh, we will talk about PCM, uh, MEM restores, and other contenders as well. Then I'll talk a bit about applications of those uh, technologies to make new memory ma matrices. Uh, non-volatile sequential cells that can be used to make uh, any digital uh, circuit you like, FPGAs and more. And in the final part, I'll talk a bit of what we are doing uh, at UFRGS to further these efforts and my final comments. So uh, the memory hierarchy today is a compromise uh, between capacity and speed. So if you have a faster memory, chances are it will be, uh, hold uh, very few bits. So the fastest memory you can find will be within uh, the processor unit. So uh, behaving as registers or uh, even uh, you find memory units in the flip-flops and uh, latches that compose uh, those digital devices. And the further you go in terms of capacity, the slower the memory will be. And uh, up till now, the working memory in our devices, cell phones, CPUs, GPUs, and wherever, they are volatile, it, which means that when you turn off the device or when you power off the device, you lose everything in that memory. So you have to load from these lower uh, portions of uh, your memory. So for instance, which we call storage, for instance, the SSDs or HDs or flash cards or embedded flash memories or even from the cloud. So you can think of the cloud as the uh, latest uh, or the furthest level from, from the processing unit. So this paradigm uh, might be broken with the emerging technologies. So uh, the emerging technologies uh, have been seen as the holy grail of uh, memories for a long time, but they didn't deliver on this promise so far. 
So that's uh, that's the, will be the question for the end. Will they deliver in the next decade? So we'll see. Um, in terms of taxonomy, uh, if you take a look at the international roadmap for devices and systems that replace the the international roadmap for transistors uh, that were was the the or in semiconductors that the the ITRS. Uh, you will see that uh, they suggest we classify those memories, uh, those emerging memories that are in general non non volatile, in baseline, prototypical, and emerging. So today, I will talk about established technologies that uh, I, I will take a look at SRAN, DRAN, and Flash, which uh, the first two are volatile and are well established and dominate the market. And then uh, in terms of uh, fast storage, you have non-volatile memories that uh, compose the baseline, so uh, which are uh, derived from the flash memory. And for the purposes of uh, this talk, uh, we will denote uh, MRAN, PCM, and, and STT, RAN, and RERAN, and the others we'll talk about as emerging memories, even though uh, are in the newest IRDS, they classify them as prototypical. So um, even though they, they are in a better state the, than uh, the others, such as SBRAN, MOT memory, and, and many others, they are, they are still not available for the consumer. So we will uh, understand that them as emerging in, in this sense. So starting with the established memory technologies. So uh, in the past, we had uh, read-only memories and programmable read-only memories in uh, video game cartridges and uh, programs that you could buy in a cartridge for your uh, home computers, such as MSX and all that old stuff that uh, is gone. So now we have three technologies that dominate the market, the static RAN or SRAN that we'll find within uh, processors, FPGAs, and devices embedded uh, with the logic in, in general, or uh, being used as cache. Then you have the dynamic RAMs, which are the ones you find in memory banks, the, such as the ones in the picture, so in the, in the, in the top picture here in the middle. Um, and then you, you may find them as well in, uh, embedded in chips such as uh, in the newest iPhone and here um, and you can find uh, flash memory for example in um, memory cards such as the ones you use in your phone or in your camera if you still have that and uh, in the new uh, smartphone such as in the iPhone 13 here so, in which I am showing the the 250 and 56 uh, gigabyte uh, flash memory that is often advertised as uh, as uh, and, and defines the price tag in the final product. So these are uh, the three technologies that we'll take a look. So a typical memory architecture. So here we will focus uh, first on uh, memory arrays because uh, they occupy the most area and and they. Uh, let's say, drive the technology forward because with regular structures, you can uh, manufacture even smaller uh, devices and they are prone to, uh, if you have uh, a unlikely um, yield issue in, in your manufacturing process, it will certainly appear on uh, a memory matrix, matrix that has a billion devices. So it's a very sensitive part of the designing process. So it's very important that we understand how uh, the design process work and how to mitigate uh, yield issues and make a reliable design. So um, the typical memory architecture will be composed of uh, columns that uh, will hold each uh, a bit of a given word. So you have several words that will be stored in memory. And to read out this word, you will uh, input an address to the memory, and then it will activate a line that's composed of several columns. And that line will um, affect 
the voltage level in, in those uh, bit line columns that you can see uh, in black in my drawing. And then you have a circuit that will translate this uh, effect into a valid uh, output level. So here I'm showing you so this uh, so usually you have uh, several million, a billion bit cells that are depicted in red in the picture. And then you have peripheral circuitry. So the peripheral circuitry uh, will be composed usually of in, an address decoder that will activate or deactivate the connection from the word to, to the bit cells or from the word to the bit lines. And then uh, we'll have a conditioning circuit that will establish a um, initial level for uh, those uh, columns. And after read uh, each uh, cell operation, uh, this level will need to be reestablished before the next operation. This uh, usually we call this uh, the pre-charge circuit because uh, usually it will uh, uh, balance the charges uh, between the bit line and the complementary bit line. Then um, we'll usually have uh, a write driver circuit, which is able to um, change uh, the voltage in those lines such that we will change the value stored in one of those bit cells so that we can uh, write a new value in this line. And then uh, finally, you have a uh, read circuit. Usually in SRAN, we called it a sense amplifier, which will uh, translate the changes that the bit cell does in in the um, in the voltage of bit lines into a valid output level. So you can see on the right side here the pre-charged circuit. What it does is that uh, once you activate it, it will uh, make um, charges flow from from the circuit to the bit line here, or uh, it will extract charges from uh, this capacitance. When um, when you want to read the cell, so and every other cell here, the bit cells are uh, disabled. So when you want to read the cell, for instance, you will put the address decoder here. You activate uh, your decoder, which in turn will connect those bit cells to your um, address decoder, and then. Uh, this will cause an effect on, on the bit cells, which will be uh, captured by the sense amplifier. So you can see, for instance, if this cell uh, holds a, a given value, one of those bit cells will uh, retain uh, its charge, whereas the other one will keep it, it, uh, its charge at a higher level. So over time, there will be a difference in voltage between these two lines. And that's what the sense amplifier captures. And then the sense amplifier will translate this difference to a logic one or logic zero. And therefore you can uh, capture the, the bit uh, that's stored uh, in that particular column for that particular line. And in doing so, in doing so for all the columns, you will uh, eventually uh, reach a conclusion about the value that's stored in the bit cells. So let's talk about uh, the bit cells and, and, the, um, and the different uh, layouts and architectures and techniques that we use to, to, build, uh, to build them. So for the SRAN technology, for example, the most popular implementation is the so-called 6T cell, meaning six transistors. So you have um, two access transistors usually built on N MOS transistors, and then you have two inverters that are uh, looped in this way. So this loop creates an actual feedback such that when you store a weak zero here, it will feed this inverter, which will produce a stronger one here, which will feed this inverter and um, make the the zero that was originally originally stored in the side a stronger zero. 
um, making this cell very small is critical because as you have thousands or millions or billion devices in your chip uh, and making a larger chip costs money, what you want is to reduce the cell as much as possible. So over time, uh, the industry converged to a thin cell that uh, is a particular arrangement of those cells that can be replicated uh, sideways and upside down to, to, to the north part here and uh, made in such a way that uh, the layout is extremely compact. So here you can see a micrograph, so uh, um, of a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a 45 nanometer um, um, SRAM. And then uh, on the right side, you you can see the detail and uh, the layout drawn over it. So you can see the transistor gates here and with the labels, you can map uh, this layout to the actual uh, schematic them showing on the top left, top right part of uh, the screen. So an optimized layout will take usually from 50 to 150 F square. F square is the minimum square you can draw in that technology for uh, a given material. So usually you take the, the transistor gate as the reference. And if the transistor gate uh, nominal, uh, uh, nominal length is 45 nanometers, then your F square is for 45 by 45 nanometers squared. So you, we normalize uh, the cell size to this uh, F square size, and then we can have a relative uh, understanding uh, of the size in terms of the technology or regardless of the technology. So an SRAM technology uh, and, or an SRAM bit cell, we usually take 50 F square for a given technology, which uh, is a lot if you compare it to other technologies such as the DRAM. So <clears throat> the DRAM is usually implemented as a transistor combined with a single capacitor. And the data stored in the DRAM uh, is the, actually the, the capacitor charge. So in the SRAM, you can say that it's also charged, but it's the charge of internal nodes that have a capacitance as a side effect of being built with transistors because those transistors uh, have very capacitive gates. In the case of uh, DRAM, you will actually build a capacitor. And this can be made uh, in several ways. But usually uh, what we are seeing nowadays is the metal, uh, metal insulator metal method that will build trenches in your uh, dielectrics. So you can see the cross-section here uh, in a drawn and uh, a cross-section that was actually taken with a, a microscopy. And then you can see um, how th this capacitor works more or less. So you, you see here, the capacitors are built on top of the transistors. So in the end, uh, this allows for a very compact uh, layout because uh, usually we care about area and not volume. So this will be taken for granted and the fabrication process. will well, It will, of course, require additional layers, but this will be included in, in your uh, manufacturing price in the end. So uh, the objective of making uh, extremely compact layouts is uh, very well achieved uh, with this kind of technology. So we can reach roughly five to six uh, F square uh, for a given DRAM technology. And then the third uh, consolidated technology is called Flash. And you obviously uh, have heard about it, if even if uh, you were new to this world of uh, microelectronics. But Flash technology um, is uh, a non-volatile technology based on charge that's trapped uh, in transistor gates. So rather than making a regular transistor, you will make a transistor that has uh, two gates and separated by an insulator. And by applying a strong enough uh, electrical field, will make uh, charges uh, cross uh, 
the uh, dielectric and being uh, and those charges will be trapped in the transistor, which will in turn affect the threshold voltage of these transistors. And then uh, by uh, calibrating your uh, voltage across the circuit, you can uh, you can um, extract the value that's uh, stored uh, in this uh, transistors. Um, and it's related to the threshold. So here you, ha you have a standard MOSFET uh, with a single gate. So you're seeing the cross section here. So you have the source and drain uh, and the uh, gate dielectric that uh, isolates the channel from the control gate. So usually when you apply some uh, voltage, you uh, build a channel here that will allow charges to flow from the source to the drain or to for from the drain to the source. And then um, in flash, you have an additional gate and then an additional dielectric and will you in turn be able to make charges uh, cross over the first dielectric and be, or you make charges that are available in, in the material to be trapped here. And then this will in turn affect uh, the threshold voltage of your transistors. Usually, um, the group you see that in flash technologies, the common thing to do is now uh, with the most uh, advanced uh, variety is to group several bits in a single cell, and that's called a NAND cell. And then uh, this uh, allows for a very compact. Um, technology, but usually the products you see made in flash, they are three to four uh, technology nodes behind uh, what's been uh, used for uh, processors and GPUs and so on. But this is uh, mostly due to, to fabrication costs and, and due to the speed of uh, writing and reading flash that we will see uh, later is uh, order of magnitude higher than uh, what you achieve with SRAN and, and DRAN. So enough of uh, consolidated uh, technologies and let's take a look on the emerging uh, memory technology that are uh, appearing in, in research and industrial research mostly, and also uh, sometimes in actual products. So here I have three examples. Um, this uh, is an FPGA that was made using um, using um, resistive RAM, and this uh, was published in 2012 in a um, in ISSCC, which is a one of the most important conferences in the field. And then um, on in the middle, you can see a FPJ that was made using MRAN that was uh, published in 2013 and was part of a project I uh, participated, um, I actually joined by the end, but uh, I, I had the opportunity to see uh, firsthand the chip fabricated. Here you can see in this uh, micrograph on the left side, you can see um, the cross-section, uh, two uh, orthogonal uh, cross-sections of the um, the devices, and then you can see the metal stacking, and then the the bottom and top electrode of the device that we'll see more detail later. Here in the middle, this micrograph shows uh, the magnetic tunnel junctions that are the basic building block of M ramps, and you can see them. Uh, can see a regular array of those uh, junctions, which uh, was part of the FPGA. In the bottom part of the slide, you can see a DDR bank uh, manufactured by every spin, so which is DIM compatible. So you could, uh, in theory, use it in your computer if you want to. And this, uh, this was the demonstrator that uh, was done by Everspin, which is a company that uh, manufactures M run from 20 years now. And then on the right side, you have uh, the Intel Optane, which is a product that you can actually buy and replace your SSD uh, devices that usually based in Flash with. 
and this uh, on on the downside you can see the micrograph that was uh, captured by and an, and published by an NTAC and uh, shows the stacking and the devices on top. So you can see uh, more or less here. And uh, this is a product that's available in the market since uh, 20, 2017. So let's take a look on those technologies, starting with the resistive RN, which was used for uh, making this FPA, FPGA, for instance. So uh, you saw that uh, most of the consolidated technologies uh, store uh, information as uh, electrical charges. And this changes with those new emerging uh, technologies. And you'll see that most, if not, not all of them, um, will we store information as a resistor that can change changes uh, its value. So um, this uh, is a micrograph where you can see uh, a top view of the um, of the RN cell, and this uh, cell here is actually composed of two resistive run devices or switchable registers, the RL and RR, and then those uh, tran those uh, resistors are connected to an access transistor. So this is a mix up of CMOS and uh, resistive RAN uh, technology. So th the main principle of those resistive RANs is that uh, you can create a dielectric material that becomes conductive under the effect uh, of an electric field that's strong enough. So whenever you want to change the value of RL or RR, you have to submit RL or RR to a uh, strong enough electric field. This objective usually um, will, will, be, will conflict with the objective of reading RL and RR because to read the resistance, what you usually do is that you apply a voltage. So when designing, you have to pay attention to apply enough electrical field to just read the cell or apply enough uh, electrical field to change the state of the cell. And that will be a theme that uh, will be recurring for, for the other technologies. Those cells here are not the only cells possible. So here we are mixing up uh, what is... Uh, um, connected to the technology to what is actually um, depend what what actually depends on design. So we can arrange your resistive run in multiple ways. So this is only the the way that was done uh, in 2012 to make that FPJ that I talked about. So if we take a closer look into the cross section, you can see the metallization that uh, is typical of any. Um, any digital or any MOS-based circuits. And then you can see the programmable register here, which in this particular case is composed of several layers of different uh, materials, being uh, usually the most important one is a aluminum oxide here. And then uh, you have uh, titanium and alumi aluminum and other um, materials that uh, are used to make contact with the metals that will run from one side to the other in your um, design. Another interesting technology is the phase change RAN, which sometimes is called PC RAN or PCM. Uh, and in the case of Intel Optane, uh, it is a version of this technology that today is called a 3D crosspoint, which uh, actually corresponds not only to the material that's used, but to the architecture to, or to the memory architecture that is uh, implemented uh, within those devices. So the typical cells that we can use with uh, PCM varies, but usually uh, you will make a cell based on 1T1R or 1T2R or 2T1R. Here you can see a 2T1R cell. So you have two access transistors, you have two uh, different bit lines and and uh, the res the resistor or the, the the PCM device in between. 
so that you can make a current flow from the top to bottom or bottom to top, depending on what you want to do. And the way this technology works is that um, the material that connects uh, either side of the devices is a phase change material. So phase here in, in terms of uh, material means that uh, it can change from an amorphous state where um, its molecules are not realigned to a polycrystal state where um, the device behaves more or less uh, like uh, polysilicon or other uh, conductive devices. So in the polycrystalline uh, uh, state, it will conduct uh, more uh, current than uh, in the amorphous state. And this is done for this kind of material by heating the material. And to heat the material, usually we will, uh, you will use a current that's large enough and you make the material very thin so that it will uh, really uh, re it will really uh, heat. And then you have to be careful not to break the material by uh, overheating it or uh, or uh, submitting it to metal erosion or and so on. I, I have to take a break here and talk about mem resistors as well because they uh, they certainly they are a buzzword that appear in this field. And aside from the theoretical aspects that um, the mem resistor would be the missing device and it has a parallel with. Uh, uh, capacitors, inductors, and resistors are as uh, basic elements. So let's not get into that. But um, the practical MEM resistor will resemble more or less a resistive RAM. But uh, actually, you can fit most of those resistive based uh, technologies into the MEM resistor model by thinking that. Uh, the MEM resistor will be a resistor that can change over time. It only, uh, usually it won't change in the rate that was uh, envisioned by uh, uh, Leon Chua that published the first uh, material on MEM resistors, but rather uh, th the switching will not necessarily be continuous. So usually you have two or four or eight states that you can reach uh, by uh, exciting your or uh, applying a current or voltage to your device. So some varieties of resistive RAN uh, will be made of a um, oxide that is usually a, an insulator, but this oxide will be doped. And then by applying an electrical field, you can um, make uh, those uh, dopants uh, more or less uh, drift through the material and established a um, smaller or larger resistance across the, the device. And this is uh, the principle of some of those uh, MEM restor uh, or practical MEM restor, such as the one that was published uh, in HP uh, by, by HP Labs some time ago. And then finally, you have... Uh, one or several varieties of magnetic RAM. And uh, the magnetic RAM is also a switchable register, but uh, coming from a completely different um, approach. So the magnetic RAMs, they are composed of uh, at least two layers of thin uh, ferromagnetic materials uh, separated by an insulator. So in this case, for example, you have uh, cobalt iron uh, barum, which is a, a magnetic material separated by uh, magnesium oxide. And then one of those uh, layers is made um, is made free and the other is made pinned in terms of magnetization. So when you apply a magnetic field, for instance, on top of the this uh, device, one of the layers will follow the magnetic field that's been applied. So it will switch its magnetization according to the external magnetic field. Whereas the other one will have a residual uh, field that will oppose the external field 
and therefore uh, keeping its magnetization. And by, uh, so by applying a magnetic field that's strong enough, you can change the free layer. Whereas um, when you apply a current, for example, in, in the material, it will have one a smaller resistance or a larger resistance. So we'll see more detail later on. Uh, so here you can see a cross-section of uh, this technology. So you have the CMOS device here below, and then you have the contacts and uh, metal, metal one, metal two, metal three uh, layers. And then you stack on top of that a MTJ, which is a stacking of several uh, materials. So usually the simplest uh, cell that we will see in magnetic run arrays is the 1T1R cell, which is composed by an access transistor and an MTJ. So if we take a look at numbers that um, I, I did my best to keep them up to date, but actually uh, some of the numbers, uh, they, they, they are uh, either based on um, material that has been published and we have a lot of progress that remains unpublished due to uh, industry secrecy. So uh, these numbers are uh, ca cannot be considered to be the actual state of the art, but it's the best you can do uh, by uh, looking into public material. So of all the technologies, uh, you can see that SRAN, STT, MRAN uh, usually offers a very low bit cell area and so does uh, PCRAN or PCM. It, it's one of the technology that's it's been demonstrated to, uh, last, to last longer. It, it means that the device uh, will not cease to function after 10 to 12 write cycles, which uh, is starting to become uh, compatible with uh, needs of uh, long storage as uh, the one we have in SSDs and flash and so on. So, and this is uh, very, very competitive with the state of the art in terms of flash uh, memories. And then in terms of read time, we are approaching the one uh, nanosecond scale, which is enough for uh, being competitive with some varieties of uh, DRAN, for example, but it's not quite there yet for actual SRAN, which uh, can be lower than that nowadays. And then in terms of write time, uh, FTT run is lagging a little behind because um, there are still issues with uh, write reliability and uh, these issues are being worked out over the years, but it still doesn't match the read time we can get with those devices. So let's take a, a closer look on, on the MTJs. Uh, so this, this is a, rep, a simplified representation of the MTJ stacking. So you have uh, a series of layers that will help uh, make, uh, make contact, electrical contact with the metallization of your circuit. And then you have the ferromagnetic free layer and the ferromagnetic pinned or fixed layer separated by this oxide. Um, from the point of view of a designer, this will act as a programmable resistor that will have a resistance uh, from one contact to another that depends basically on the free layers magnetization. So if the free layers magnetization is uh, opposite to the fixed layer magnetization, it will have a higher resistance. Whereas if they agree in terms of magnetization, you have a lower resistance. And this uh, we could go into more detail, but I will keep it at, at that. You can look uh, at the tunnel magneto resistance effect that uh, is the governing physics principle that uh, that affects uh, the resistance of those MTJs. And those uh, those values, the maximum resistance and the minimum resistance are usually um, used to calculate the TMR ratio, which is a key parameter for the designers. And the higher the TMR ratio, the easiest is to do circuits that can understand if, we're, if uh, we are in the lower or the higher resistant state, and therefore uh, we can 
easily uh, discern a logic zero for a logic one if we are, we are uh, storing uh, logical values uh, associated directly with the resistance, for instance. So to, in order to write, we'll see that uh, there are several uh, families. Uh, some of them are based on applying a magnetic field to the junction. And some of them are based on applying a electrical current, uh, a particular strain of electrical current uh, to, to the junction. So from the designer point of view, you can see this as a one port network or a, a, a dipole or a two port network, which will have one port for reading and another port for writing. And in terms of modeling, uh, the conductance actually may vary with the voltage you apply to the junction. It may vary with the temperature and several other parameters. And that, that has to be taken into account while uh, designing your uh, device. So in terms of uh, MTJ families, uh, the first family was the field-induced magnetic switching, um, which uh, uses two... Uh, magnetic fields to um, change or to interact with the, the magnetization in the junction. And this family was later evolved to the toggle films, which was, uh, oh, it's similar, but you uh, fabricate your MTJ with a four, 45 uh, degrees angle with respect to those lines. And then uh, you can maximize um, the selectability of your cells. So when you apply a field H1 and a field H2, then you'll be uh, more certain that this field won't won't affect in a significant way um, the surrounding cells. Because if you're doing memory, what you want is to pack as many MTJs as possible in your grid. So. This uh, generation had, uh, in order to produce uh, a fields that were uh, large enough to affect the MTJs, you have to uh, use currents in the order of milliamps, which is a lot for integrated circuits. So uh, this family was later evolved. So this is the family that's nowadays fabricated by Everspin, which was, is one of the... Uh, companies that uh, has been investing in MRAN for a long time. And then um, an evolution of that was the TAS or TAS uh, technology, which stands for thermally assisted switching. So this technology uh, was promoted. First, it was a research result from SpinTech in France, and then uh, it evolved to a uh, it was transferred to a company called Crocus Technology, which is nowadays invested in uh, circuits for cybersecurity and so on. And then uh, this technology is similar to FIMS, but uh, they engineered the junction to be sensible to the magnetic field only when heated. So you heat the, the you heat your junction. And this will uh, change the materials properties and they will be more uh, susceptible to uh, external magnetic fields. So this improved the selectability of, uh, of a given cell a lot and helped uh, reducing the switching current. So in, in, the, in the initial prototypes, it was about 15 milliamps, but today is much lower. <clears throat> and the... Uh, the family that you see the most now, that's the most evolved, and I, I didn't put any logos there because it's actually being researched by everyone else, is the STT or spin transfer torque, which uh, uses a single uh, read and write path. And it works like this. You apply a spin polarized current uh, to the junction and this uh, current will interact with the magnetization of the material and will uh, be able, if strong enough, to revert this magnetization. And the junction is, engineering, is engineered to act like a spin polar, polarizer uh, filter so that if you flow your current in one sense, it will have 
more uh, spin up current than spin down and if you flow it in the other sense it will have more spin down current than spin up and then uh, using uh, this technique you can uh, you can simplify your circuit a lot because you have one single path and you don't require a magnetic field anymore and this means that uh, your right current which was in the scale of milliamps at the time uh, this uh, this technology appeared, can be reduced to the scale of microamps. And this uh, helped to further uh, the integration of those devices to, to another scale. So here you can see uh, in a bit more detail uh, how the FIMS work. So you have a grid of... Uh, MTJs that are connected to uh, to uh, actually are connected to a tran access transistor, and at the same time you have uh, metal lines that are um, surrounding the the junction, and by applying a current to these metal lines, it, they will generate a magnetic field which will uh, interact with the junction. And so you arrange your circuit in such a way that uh, to reverse the magnetization of your uh, junction, you need the combination of those two magnetic fields. So that's what you see here. So you see the junction and, and one of the magnetic fields that is orthogonal to the other. And you can only change the magnetization if you reach this state here. So in the thermally assisted switching, you will uh, apply first a heat current that will shift. Uh, so here you can see a resistance to magnetic field uh, graph. And then when you once you heat that, it will put the hysteresis curve of the magnetization in phase uh, with uh, the intensity of the field you are applying. And then you will apply a field that's strong enough to overcome the coercive field of your uh, magnetic uh, junction and uh, reverse the magnetization of uh, your device. And finally, for the spin transfer torque switch, you can uh, better see it from a plot of the MTJ resistance versus the current flowing to, through the, the MTJ. And then usually you are in either one of those states, so near the parallel resistance or near the anti-parallel resistance. And parallel and anti-parallel refers to the relationship between the free layer and the fixed layer of magnetization. And then if apply a current that's strong enough, you will eventually switch from uh, one region to the other. And the strong enough current will actually be uh, a, a function of uh, how long uh, lasts the current pulse. So when you design, you have to take care of that. You have to apply current for enough time and with enough intensity such that you will uh, eventually overcome the magnetization that is uh, actually uh, at that moment stored in the RMTJ. So here you can see the, um, you can see that if your current is smaller than the reversal current, then your MTJ will present a more or less a stable uh, parallel or anti-parallel uh, resistance, which you can use to read and actually infer whether your MTJ is storing a logic one or a logic zero. So once you have uh, established a technology, you will start by making uh, basic building blocks that later on can uh, be evolved and uh, mixed together to make complex circuits. So part of uh, the research I conducted in these years uh, is related to uh, studying those basic building blocks that have been proposed over the years and to understand how they can uh, be used to some of those applications. 
so the first uh, building block that you need is a circuit that's able to translate the resistance of your uh, MTJ to uh, an actual logic uh, level output. So this can be done by uh, the peripheral circuits in your memory array. So um, instead of uh, using a complex circuit like that, you can, for instance, use a circuit like that and then uh, couple this with the peripheric circuit as the ones we see uh, right before. So let me, so you make a version of this sense amplifier that is able to sense whether the resistance here is low or high based on, on either the current that flows uh, through these lines and enters the, your uh, circuit or by the voltage difference between those two lines. So that depends on, on the way you make your circuits. Or, so if you're not interested in making uh, memory matrices, but you're interested in using MTJs in among your random logic and you want them to be as fast as possible, you can build a six, eight, 10 uh, transistor circuit that can translate those MTJ uh, resistance to actual uh, logic uh, ones or zeros and can be used right away in your circuit. This, uh, those techniques, they, even though they were studied for a given target technology, they are actually applicable to any of those uh, resistance-based technologies. So when we talk about reading circuits, we are talking about reading circuits that are um, useful for RAN, MRAN, PCM, and any other technology. The writing circuits, on the other hand, they will be specific to each device because some of them will require two currents, some of them will require a magnetic field, some of them uh, will require an electric field that's strong enough. So that will be really uh, depending uh, that will really depend on the technology you are using. So here, for instance, we have a very simple design of a um, of a two inverters that will be connected to the, uh, each uh, one of the MTJ terminals, which would be uh, proper for STT writing if uh, those inverters are uh, properly uh, designed. And of course, you have to consider the read path that will be coupled to this uh, write drivers as well. So the, the circuit won't exist by itself as it's shown here. So um, the typical MRUN array will be composed by either 1T1R uh, cells or either 1D1R cells or uh, cross point cells, which are very uh, difficult to deal with. But usually you see either 1T1R or 2T1R. And then um, your write driver will be similar to this one. So it will produce current if, if this target, say STT, uh, MTJ technology, it will produce a, a current that flows from the left side to the right side uh, through the MTJ or the opposite direction. Your sense amplifier usually will um, either compare your resistance or the voltage drop across your resistance to a reference cell. So that's the, the one we see the most in the literature. So it will be uh, somewhat different from what you see uh, for SRAN, for instance. As for the preconditioning, uh, it will probably be similar, but it will depend on if you want to hold a zero, zero value or if you want just to eliminate the charge that uh, might be accumulated on, on the bit line and bit line bar. So it won't be exactly the same as uh, the one you see in SRAM. If you want a very small, very fast array, for example, for use in lookup tables, as we'll see uh, later on, you can use a self-referenced cell. So a self-referenced cell will be a grouping of a cell of this kind, a cell that produces from one or two MTJs per bit and appropriate a logic level on the output. So this cell actually will uh, bundle the sense amplifier within itself. 
So this uh, allows you to work with MTJs that uh, have a TMR ratio that's quite low. But on the other hand, uh, it sacrifices a lot of density because if this cell can reach, let's say, 5F square, those cells will be in the vicinity of 50 to 60 to 100 uh, F square. So in terms of uh, self reference cells you can you can have uh, several flavors and here uh, we studied uh, some of them in this uh, publication that was uh, made some some years ago in the transactions on magnetics so basically uh, we investigated uh, those cells that were proposed in several papers uh, but uh, we we had the care to uh, bundle in the um, right drivers as well and all the circuit that's needed to make sure that writing does not interfere with reading and vice versa so um, this graph uh, summarizes some of the conclusions we we reached on several topics so basically we saw that the has cell is uh, one of the fastest ones but it consumes a, a lot of power whereas uh, this RSRN is uh, quite a good com uh, compromise between uh, all of those uh, crit criteria. So if you want uh, to see more details, you can ask me or, or take a look at the paper. Um, you can also make uh, sequential cells with uh, based on those self-referenced uh, self cells. You can make sequential cells that can be used within your logic. So for instance, here, this is uh, based on the PCSA, which uh, was uh, one of the basic uh, cells that we studied before. So it's this one, so a version of this actually. And then if you combine this uh, with parts of a, a CMOS flip-flop, you can make this uh, obey the same logic as the flip-flop, being sensitive to the edge and not to the level and produce uh, valid timings uh, that you can use in your standard layout. And this, when we, we did that, we were using a very experimental technology that has a huge uh, write current. So therefore, the write driver was uh, larger than a full CMOS uh, flip-flop by itself. But if the current reduces to a sustainable level, then surely we'll be able to make uh, non-volatile flip-flops that are competitive with their uh, volatile counterparts. We can also make lookup tables for FPGAs based on those uh, very same cells. So a lookup table is a small memory array that um, has uh, some peripheral logic that will help us uh, drive uh, or bring the data to, to where it belongs in the into the FPGA. So if you want to implement a logic function, you will store the entries of uh, the truth table of this logic function and we'll address it using the inputs. And sometimes you have a registered uh, loot. So in all of the FPGAs, you have that. So you, you may, uh, you may, for instance, combine that with a flip flop such as the one I showed before. So this was uh, these were some of the proposals uh, we found we found in the literature, and one of those was implemented uh, in the FPJ that was made by by Learman in, in 20, uh, 2013. Um, so the interest uh, in making non volatile flip uh, non volatile FPJs is that you can um, you can remove the flash memory that is uh, usually used to uh, bring up the, the bit stream in your FPGA and configure your device because if those LUTs and if the routers and everything is stored in MRUN, then your configuration will be stored forever or uh, up to the point you, you change it. So that's the, the main advantage. You could use a single memory chip to, to keep everything there. Then uh, another proposal that uh, another proposal that we saw in in the literature was the uh, proposal of a non-volatile processor in which uh, you replace each 
register uh, in your processor by a, by its known volatile counterpart. And then this um, this cell is also similar to the ones we we showed you before. And this uh, was used to replace uh, the flip flops in the same way we we showed before. And this was made for by a grouping the Tohoku University in Japan. And there we were able to demonstrate a MIPS processor that was fully um, based on non-volatile uh, memory. And this uh, screenshot of an oscilloscope shows uh, the moment in which the processor is turned off and then uh, it's made to uh, start over again. And it will start from the latest uh, execution state it held before being turned off. And that's the, the main advantage, instantaneous uh, on-off power. So that, that's one of the features we could have if uh, our non-volatile memories were, were as fast as our volatile memories we use nowadays. Another application that uh, has been uh, demonstrated in at some extent in, uh, in the literature is um, neural networks based on NVMs. So for instance, you will make a, a memory that represents the weights in your uh, neural network. And so this is this uh, shows each bit of your memory. And then um, after each cycle, you will um, receive your input as a value. <coughs> Sorry. You receive your input as a um, as a uh, address to your memory. You will um, load your weights and multiply them using a computing memory logic, or that means in practice uh, having some logic bundled in your either inside your array or in your peripheric circuits. So in this case, in particular. It has a MOOC, say, analog to digital converter, because uh, they are supposing that their um, RN devices are actually uh, continuously uh, variable. So their resistance will vary over a, a continuous uh, range. So you convert that uh, into digital, and then you add with the previous values. And in this way, you can make a memory chip that's uh, Structurally, we will implement a neural network uh, with a given topology. So this is uh, one of the applications that uh, are being uh, seen a lot in, in the research uh, in this area. And I believe that in a few years, we will have products that uh, are based on, on this. So if we take a look at general, this comes from a, a consulting firm called Yo Development um, that mapped uh, some of the um, applications that are appearing. So there is much more than what I showed you. So I restricted myself to digital applications. So uh, I'm looking for um, memory CPUs, uh, application specific uh, units or uh, GPUs and so on, but uh, there are other applications such as sensors and uh, drivers and so on that uh, can be explored and can benefit from non-volatile memory that's fast enough uh, or at least as fast as the volatile counterparts we have nowadays dominating the market. So. I guess the main question is uh, when will when ENVMs uh, reach final users? So Global Foundries uh, last year projected that uh, their 22 nanometer MRAN is becoming as good as their e 28 nanometer E-Flash, that's the current product. And they see that in the future, um, they, they will pursue uh, products that are based on M run as well. Meanwhile, uh, Intel, for instance, uh, they acquired Infineon a couple of years back, and a research that started uh, more or less 10 years ago became a product in, in Micro and then Infineon, and then ended up uh, being the Intel Optane that you can see now, which is a cross point architecture, meaning 
uh, it has no excess transistor so the the selectivity is made by uh, using um, passing currents through uh, several terminals that are connected to the device and you can see that uh, now it became a product that uh, might replace uh, flash SSDs in your computer, for instance. Meanwhile, flash keep evolving. So uh, in, in the last five, six years, we saw the appearance of 3D uh, NAND flashes, which is more or less what you see here. So this is a research paper. This is an actual, actual white paper from SanDisk. And then you can see, for example, in Samsung products, uh, uh, flash memories that uh, are actually based on this 3D technology. So we have also FinFAT SRAMs as a contender, and uh, it's hard to say uh, whether uh, MRAN will take over at, or will be restricted to uh, some specific markets. So you have to wait and see what, what will happen. So... Uh, in this final part, uh, I would like to talk a little bit of uh, what we are doing here at UFRGS. So a couple of years back, we launched a uh, open CMOS and MRUN PDK that um, is mostly used to benchmark tools and to do design space exploration, for example, to simulate a new uh, MRUN-based architectures, even though uh, you have no access to an actual uh, PDK from, from a foundry because they are quite restricted still nowadays. So you can take a look at the paper. I, I put the reference there. And this is not really uh, available for download at this point. But if you are interested, uh, you drop me an email and you, we, we can talk about it. So this is... Um, that our PDK is able to uh, interact with standard tools such as Mentor Caliber and uh, Virtuoso and so on. And uh, the idea is mostly that you can exercise your flow and you can test new ideas before uh, you actually have access to a, a actual technology. So another um, research that we conducted in the past was to um, estimate the influence of heavy ions in the uh, in memory arrays. So this was uh, conducted using a TCAD simulation uh, combined with a compact MTJ model, and this was published in 2017. So uh, what we we saw in the simulation is that usually the MTJ device is quite um, robust and immune to have ion impact, but the transistors on the other hand, which is a fact that there is no, are quite susceptible. So uh, memories that combine CMOS and MTJ are still uh, prone to uh, have ions or other kinds of particles impact and they must be protected accordingly. And today we are uh, mostly concerned about uh, electrical modeling of MTJs, uh, which can be done by supposing that the MTJ constitutes a single magnetic domain or multiple domains, which uh, can be conducted by supposing that we have information about the dynamics of the magnetization, or we just uh, simplify that to a static behavior. And uh, we started uh, with a study on um, some compact models that already exist and compare them to micromagnetic models that are the TCAD equivalent for MTJs. And then uh, we are working towards a co-simulation environment that can <clears throat> um, combine the accuracy that you have uh, in terms of uh, modeling MTJs in a micromagnetic, a micromagnetic simulator with the flexibility you have to simulate um, transistors in a, an electrical simulator. <clears throat> so this is uh, some of the results, uh, just to illustrate a little bit. So um, we have a junction that has been excited by a voltage source. <clears throat> And then the current enough to uh, switch the 
MTJ from uh, its uh, most resistive state to its least uh, resistive state. And what you see in the bottom is the electrical simulation as seen by uh, Cadence Spectre Simulator. And what you see on the top is uh, the micromagnetic simulation view. And those, those two simulators interact and produce an instantaneous response, both in terms of uh, the magnetization as a function of the space. So you can see what's really happening in your free layer. And as well as a, um, a simplified value that can see uh, the resistance value that can be seen from an electrical standpoint. So this is uh, when your MTJ is uh, magnetized towards the anti-parallel state. And then this is during switching. So you can see that your uh, your magnetization is uh, orthogonal now to the uh, easy axis of this MTJ. And then uh, in the third state, you can see uh, the parallel resistance reached after some time and with some oscillation. And those aspects, how much time does it take to switch and how much do you oscillate, they are key to making a good design. So um, going to the final comments, um, this field presents a several opportunities for researchers and engineers and research engineers as well. So both uh, or in terms of uh, process engineering, device physics, compact modeling, new hardware architectures, and there is plenty of potential there, and EDA and CAD tools. And we are seeing in the last decade, more than ever, uh, a huge academic and industrial interest. So we have seen uh, dedicated seminars, uh, so events that are targeted to this specific topic. We can see dedicated sessions in top conferences, such as DAC, DATE, IEDM, VLSIT, ISSCC, and many others. And we've seen a massive R&D investments, uh, especially uh, by the industry uh, and the big players in the market, such as Samsung, Hitachi, NEC, and, and Intel, and many others. And I guess the final question is, will these technologies become mainstream? So I think they do have the potential, but uh, in the current state of affairs, there is a huge um, dominance with other technologies that are always evolving. So I think that uh, it probably will take a while for us to see that in every device as we see S run and D run. And with that, uh, I would like to thank my my crew, so to speak. So Paulo Butson, who recently or well, let's say for a year, two years, uh, joined our team. And um, many of the researchers that uh, worked or are still working with us, Paulo, Felipe, Bruno, Klaus, uh, Bruna, Elisa, and Cesar. And of course, to the audience. And I hope that uh, this uh, talk was insightful and I hope uh, it helped you uh, know a bit more about this topic. And uh, if you have any questions, you can to them, ask them now or send me an email. I'll be, uh, it will be certainly a pleasure to answer them. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael, for your talk. It's a very exciting talk. Uh, we have one question from Professor Sergio Bumpy. Uh, I will oh, try to show, yes. Of those promising EMVM, do you think the STTMTJ is one of the more stable with better controllability and faster maturing to scale production? Yes, yes, I think that both STTMTJ and the PCM memory that's been uh, evolving, uh, especially with Intel, I think they are the, the most mature and the most stable. And in terms of, uh, they are maturing fast, but they are not still quite there, I guess. It will take a couple of years still to have MTJ fabrication that helps us to reach the gigabit scale in terms of uh, memory chips. So right now, uh, it's not quite there yet. Okay, we have another question from Professor Altamiro Suzin. 
Interesting presentation. Thank you. I would like to know if my devices are sensitive to magnetic noise generated by motors or switches in the near environment. That's a very good question. So thank you, Suzine. Um, what I saw is that uh, usually the, their, their junctions are very small and and usually they they pro they are provided with some packaging that tries to uh, isolate them from from noise, but actually you can't do that <laughs> on a certain scale. So yes, they will be uh, sensitive, as uh, our hard drives were in the past. So that that's an annoyance actually, because with flash drives we have this advantage that uh, we are no longer susceptible to to engines and switches and everything, and now. Yes, we'll be more likely to to see uh, perturbations in the junction. Thank you. Uh, please write your questions in the chat. Uh, I have one, Rafael. Uh, you have shown uh, several uh, open points in the last slides that the the academy and the industry are focusing. In your opinion, what is the bottleneck to to let these emerging memories be in the mainstream? There are two bottlenecks that I read about uh, in the, in the past years, and and I um, still think that they are the, the main issues. So one of them is uh, going. Um, going further down uh, the one nanosecond barrier because those devices they they seem to 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 be limited in terms of uh, scaling so um, we, we are trying to to reach a reliable writing of the MTJs in the nano scale or the nanosecond uh, scale but uh, it seems that this is quite hard to achieve. And the other aspect that I think that might be overcame if uh, the industry wants, but so far is is a problem, is the integration of materials that are not common in the CMOS industry. So those uh, th those materials that I, I I presented you just a simplified view of the MTJ stack, but you have uh, materials and 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 compounds that are uh, Usually not seen in the CMOS uh, foundries. So, so this uh, this if I, I believe that if uh, the industry sees the interest, it may be uh, it may be no longer a problem. But right now, to integrate those processes is quite difficult. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, we have no more question. Then I thank you again for the excellent talk. I invite Professor Ricardo to the final announcements. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Ricardo. And see you next time. So thank you again, Rafael, for this very nice uh, talk. Also, thank Paulo to be the session chair today. And uh, see you next Friday. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.